Warm greetings to everyone that is joining us home from home. Um, we are so excited to join with you today as we start a new series. Yes, we're starting a new series on privilege, which is going to be interesting in light of everything that is um, that has been happening. And so this week, we're going to be starting with privilege, and then we're going to go to different forms of privilege over the next weeks. Uh, and so before we go into this week, I just want to allow Els and Rebecca to remind you who they are. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, I'm Rebecca and I'm just part of the Grace Point team. Hey everyone, um, I'm Ilza, also part of the Grace Point team, the Hot Topics team and the Gap Ministry. Awesome, um, but we are really excited for this topic. So when we started speaking about privilege today, um, I know we we're all excited, different feelings in the room. And this is because it's we are also, we're not divided, necessarily divided, but we're all trying to find a way around understanding the concept of privilege mm. and at times it gets lost in language and so we thought maybe this is one topic that deserves a series so that we can unpack it and journey together and I just want to encourage you from home that you really do take this as a journey invite your friends to watch it discuss it with people at home and yeah so this week we're going to be speaking about just the concept of privilege what on earth is this thing called privilege yeah, and I think also just before we get on to that, we are so excited for us to learn from each other, and we don't want we want this to be a learning experience. We're not preaching at you. We're not saying that our views are the correct views. Um, we're not saying that we have all the answers, but I think that we just want to make sure that we do not remain silent and that silence and that our silence becomes deafening. So I think for us it is. So you'll notice that over the next couple of weeks, our hot topics will be a little bit longer than usual. We've tried to keep them at 20 minutes, um, but we just feel like in order for this discussion to be of value, we decided as a team that it would be a little bit longer than um, normal. And we really would encourage you to, uh, we'll have resources and stuff at the end of each video that you can click on, that you can go. We'd really encourage you to, um, not just view this as something that you participate with on Sundays, but something to take into your life, your everyday life. Yeah. So what's privilege? Um, I think we'll all just share our understanding of privilege and the topic will kick on from there. But even at home, you know, it would be nice for you to think about what have you always considered privilege? Mm. You know, um, I don't know. Should we kick it from that side? Yeah. Great. Um, I think for myself, I have, I have... Per, obviously for me it will have a different meaning to everyone else, but I've grown up very privileged. I have, I went to a private school. Uh, when I turned 18, I got my first car. Um, I got a phone when it was like the thing to do. Um, I have always, whatever I've wanted or needed, I have almost always got. I spent a year in London, uh, which was amazing. I have... Um, I have an extreme amount of my own privilege. I have an extreme, extreme amount of white privilege. Um, and I think for me, I've had, to, I've had to come to terms with what my privilege looks like. Um, and I think for me, it means I have been afforded more opportunity um, in my life than other people, and specifically black people, would not have been afforded um, the opportunity of, um, and I know we're not getting into white privilege this week, but that is the that is the only the context in which I can speak from is that I have I have white privilege and I have leveraged my white privilege um, in my lifetime, and I've seen uh, I was in a shop the once um, with one of my best friends, and we were looking around, and this is probably the first time that I really experienced the degree of my white, white privilege. We are walking around and we were, it wasn't, we were just looking at stuff. It was, I don't know if you guys know or remember 7-Eleven. Yeah. Um, I was walking around the 7-Eleven and the owner was there and he was following my friend Latifa throughout the whole store. Every time she went through a corner, every time she like looked at drinks and I never, I never thought about, I was so confused by it, not in the moment because I was so ignorant to my privilege. And Latifa and I were walking, Latifa's from Nigeria, um, and well, she was born in the UK. Um, 
but she said, did you not notice what was going on? And I was like, no, I have no idea. And he was specific, the store owner was specifically watching her to see if she was going to steal something. Um, and that was one of the first times that I can remember where I was so ignorant to my privilege as a, as a white person. Um, and yeah, and I can give you millions of examples since, but that is my understanding of privilege. Absolutely, man. Um, you know, I, I, I draw my, my understanding of privilege from a, from a definition I, I shared with, with the group, you know, where um, Peggy McIntosh says it's an invisible package of unearned benefits. Mm. You know, um, and I, I can look into my own life, you know, and number one, firstly, as a male, um, I've had a lot of privilege. You know, um, I know we'll go into that later on also. Um, we're going to speak about male privilege at some point. But I also realized, for instance, you know, as a, as a, as a young man, I remember um, <laughs> chatting to my mom-in-law and we was, you know, getting, getting ready for the wedding and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> and, she, <laughs> and I pray she forgives me if she's watching this. But she said, um, she says to my wife, I hope you know how to cook. You know, I hope you, you, you have to learn how to cook, you know, so that you can look after your hubby. You know, and I noticed no one's asking me those questions. Mm. You know, um, no one asks me questions about, um, do I know how to cook? Um, and th there's just so much male privilege that I've had access. And I've, at times I've honestly used it. Having gone to a boys' school for the first couple of years in high school, I was exposed to what male privilege can honestly afford you. You know, we had a sister school just down the road. And for instance, they weren't allowed to eat while they were walking. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and I remember my first girlfriend, first high school girlfriend was from the sister school. I'm standing with her the other day and she tells me of this rule that I had no idea about. We come from the same school and she says to me, our school does not allow us to stand with boys like they, they're meant to be like five feet apart. You know, and we were oh never told goodness. this, you know. And I'm thinking to myself, if we're gonna have, uh, if we're gonna encourage young people to maintain a certain behavior when it comes to relationships, surely the rules should apply for both, you know, and not just for the one person, but even other stuff growing up, you know. And you can literally see your privilege, you know. Yeah. And for me, I've been exposed to male privilege, but I've also been exposed to privilege that's been afforded me, that I've been afforded through proximity to white spaces. There are times when I've had my piece of the pie from white privilege, even though I'm not white. Yeah. I think it's really interesting what both of you raise, you know, about all these different types of privilege. And I think something that I'm yet to discover or starting to discover is that, you know, privilege is this thing that is around us, but we're not aware of it at all times. Just because we're not aware of it doesn't mean it's not there. Mm. It doesn't mean we don't benefit from it. I think I'm on a, like we all said, we're on a journey together. And I think I'm on a journey where I'm only yet starting to discover what, are the, what is the depth and to where the privilege that I have reaches me and gets me to and what have I been afforded that, you know, um, I, I've been, what advantages have I been given? Um, maybe not something I've earned, but just because of, who I am, who I'm associated with, uh, my history, where we come from, you know, our people, that type of thing. And so I think it's important just to note that it just because we don't realize it's there doesn't mean it's not there. Um, for myself, I'm, I'm starting, the more I hear people's stories of privilege, the more I realize mine. Um, it, it's really a case of the more you start to see privilege that other people have been able to acknowledge and, and become aware of, you start to look at your experiences, your life mm -hmm. differently, and you start to realize your privilege. Yeah, and I, I was just, so when I was preparing for this, you know, we use terms so much like privilege or white privilege, privilege or systemic, and I don't think we have an understanding of, or it's certainly not I, and um, I was going through um, a whole bunch of different definitions and I saved a few and the first of privilege is a special right advantage or immunity granted or available only to a particular person or group and then I, I saw this thing that said which word is similar to privilege right and it is advantage like there's this advantage the thing with privilege is that we have an advantage and it whether it's male privilege, whether it's white privilege, the truth is that there's an advantage, and usually, and with an advantage, it means an advantage over someone else, an advantage over a race, over a sex, um, over a sexuality, 
Um, and I think that is that is what I'm most excited about getting into. I think it's so easy to um, say that, oh, there is privilege, but then not to always acknowledge the times that there is privilege or are privilege. And um, I have certainly too often allowed myself to be propelled forward because of privilege and actually put it in the back of my mind and said, oh, it's okay, it's okay, it is because I'm talented, it is because I'm gifted, but actually it's just because I'm more seen. Um, I've been given, afforded so many opportunities to preach, not just in a grace point context, but in, in different places. And I know for a fact that there's a, a black person, a black woman, who can preach 10 times better than me and who's 10 times more qualified than me. But instead, but because I'm more seen, I get the the role or the advantage to speak and to speak or to lead or to do anything. And I, I messaged a friend the other day in light of this George Floyd thing, one of my black friends, and I said, what can I do? What, what can I do differently? And then someone said to me that they can't, black people can't be white people's therapists. We can't go to black people expecting them to make us feel better or to give us these tools and these trainings. But she did say to me, she said, Rebecca, and she was so gracious in it. She said, it means stepping aside when an opportunity is afforded to you that you know a black person can do better. And being able to step aside and say, no, I don't want to do this. But actually, Rebecca, that's a very critical point that I want to save to its the end. Because I think it speaks into what a lot of people ask. After we've had these conversations, mm. what do I do with privilege? Yeah. You know, because at the that's and that's where I really would want to leave this conversation. But I really want to go back to what you mentioned in terms of advantage. You know, I, I know a lot of people who struggle with the whole concept to say there is earned advantage. I saw my parents work hard, mm. but you want to call it privilege. You know, and in many of the conversations I've had while preparing for this, um, in order to get other people's views, one of the points that keeps on coming up is earned advantage versus privilege. You know, And yesterday while reading this one article that honestly maybe helped me get somewhere in terms of understanding that, not that I've con- exhausted the concept at all, there's still much more for me to learn, is they say the difference between the two is that one, with earned advantage, it has its limits. If I work hard to do something, you know, it has its limits. It's not this wild card that can grant me access to anything and everything. Yeah. And then it goes on to say, but with privilege, when I've got privilege because I'm a male, when I've got privilege because of my race, when I've got privilege because I'm a South African citizen, you name it, what it does is that it gives me this wild card that can be used anywhere and everywhere. A typical example is you and I can walk in a township together. And you will, or you and I can walk, not merely, not, not, let's not say a township, let's say in the world generally. Yeah. A person of another color will possess much more authority than I would. Yeah, a person of another of, color or of another of white. Race. Oh. A white person yeah. would command much more respect than I would, much more authority. I have to work extra hard. Yeah. You know, if you and I had to go to a place where masculinity is the, Order of the day. So anyway. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I would command much more authority than you or else. That is a reality. Mm. You know, so that's not earned privilege. That comes because I'm a male, you know. And I've always had the struggle, man. I don't know about you guys, but I've always had the struggle with earned advantage and privilege, even in conversation with friends. I think like the lines are very blurred between the two. I think definitely it's, it's quite blurry. And what I kind of found with doing some research is often when we speak about privilege, we focus so much on the, the one aspect or the other. You know, we either focus on the disadvantage, not acknowledging our own advantage, or we, you know, and we, we don't look at both sides. And it's, it's because of my advantage, others are disadvantaged. Um, and so with that same concept of what is earned and um, what is given, you know, it's not to say that because I have privilege, I haven't earned anything I've got. But maybe there's been an aspect of what I've earned has been, has been enabled or made easier because of my privilege. Yeah, and I think that what you've said, I think, is interesting because 
with earned privilege, right, is as a white person, let's say you and I are going for the same goal, okay? We have to do something to earn it, right? Like we have to show up, we have to do... I think that there's still privilege afforded to me, even though we're both um, working towards the same goal, right? So I don't know if you, any of you watched... Gonna come to me now. It's got a live. It's her name's Olivia Pope and it's Kerry Washington. Um, but I see I, I about the president, it, I know what the saying. fixer. Yes. Um, and basically, her dad has a conversation with her and says, "You have to work ten times harder, ten times smarter, ten times faster, um, smarter than white people and than men because of the color of your skin and because of the sex that you have." Uh, the gender that you are and I think for me so Claudia, if you and I have a common goal let's say you and I want to become a CEO of a bank okay they're all even pastors okay let's be serious we both want to be pastors okay let's not speak in the hypothetical um there are certain we both have to do things we both have to go through training we both have to do this we both have to do that the truth is that I will always get it easier even though it is um, this that we're both working, we're both doing things to get there to attain this, yeah. it's still going to be easier for me because of the perceived, not perceived, because of the privilege that my skin color holds. Spot on. Actually, that's a, such a critical point. I'll, you know, for instance, I'll give you a typical example. We say, if I have to prepare for a sermon, mm-hmm. I have to one consider what. Western epistemology says, you know, but I also have to consider that what African epistemology says around the topic so that I also do not betray my own values. You know, so when preparing for a topic, even in my faith formation journey, I have to acknowledge that, wait, this is the context here, but I also need to bring myself into my context. And in order to bring myself into this context, I cannot disregard who I am. Mm. You know, so I deal with all of that, you know, number one. Number two, even in engaging just, for instance, I was reading, a, I was actually reading a book around when I was doing a, uh, one of the papers that to do for confirmation. It speaks about how, for instance, um, during one's vocational discernment journey as a young person, one of the things you have to do is you then have to acknowledge the different spheres of life and learn to separate them and apply ethics in those different spheres of life, you know? Mm. Learn to say, I'm at work. Learn to say, I'm at home. Now, in order for a young black person to do that, there is a lot that they need to first unlearn. Because for me, the same person, so for instance, the kids who see my mom where we live, she's a school teacher. They see her as the same person. Yes, she's a teacher, but they still see her as a mother. Yeah. And they now have to learn to separate, going into this world. You know, so for instance, now they, they're coming from this world where a child is brought up by, by a village. And now, now they have to live in this world and learn how to thrive in this world where they expect her to separate these different roles. You know, um, so that's, that's but one example. You know, um, even when you look in terms of one's faith formation, the stuff that one has to acknowledge in saying, okay, cool, as a, uh, um, you know, growing up in a Western context, um, having to bounce between a Western context and a black context, one has to work twice as hard in order to keep the balance and to thrive in both the contexts. I had to wake up at five o'clock in order to get to school. And yeah. my peers could wake up at eight o'clock in order to get to school at the same time. By the time we get to school, I'm already, I've been awake for three hours. And then the school says, sports is compulsory. That means I have to stay till four o'clock. Transport comes and picks me up and takes me home. I get to home at what time? I get to home at six o'clock. I have to do my homeworks. I've got house chores. I still want to have child, I still want to have me time. Yeah. And at times I end up neglecting one of those. Of course. And let's say I neglect the homework. And that means I cannot optimize my performance. Yeah. And I think that there's so much, and I think this is even part of the problem where white people come and they try to fix a situation for you 
or fix the situation that you're in because it's actually not an understanding of what you go through. There's an issue, like let's say your grades start to drop and it's like, how can we help you? The truth is the best way to help you is to get you on campus, to get you, but then that's taking, like, to, so you're closer to school, but that's taking out of the context that you grew up in. And now there's new issues. It's how do I adapt to the fact that I've been grown up in a village, now I must come out like boarding, like let's just say there's a boarding school, and you're thrown into a whole new context. Now you have to get used to this context, which is also traumatic and draining and a new normal for you to get used to. So now you've been taken out of a context that you know, perceived as being helpful, but actually could be just as damaging to you and your performance um, as a person, you know? And I think, I, just while you were speaking, I think the fact that that reality is unspoken of, I've, I haven't been in schools for seven years now, but like, I think the fact, and I don't know if this is true, so this is a generalization, which maybe I shouldn't make, but I don't know how often that's spoken about, right? That we're not, people see you coming to school, they think, oh my goodness, Flonie's here. Like that. And this actually, I don't know if I can say this on camera, but I'm going to say it anyway. Were you at school, Flonie, or were you Sean at school? And you see, that's another one. So here's, so this is interesting, hey? Uh, and again, forgive me if you're watching. It's, it's, it's a life experience that we need to draw from. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take the same question, but bring it into church context, you know? So, you know, um, this one church that I served at, you know, so I tell them that my name is Kloni. <laughs> you know, and they asked me for my email so that they can put it, obviously, on some of the stuff. So people can contact me and which name I'd prefer to use, you know, Lisa Honolo. And boom, an email comes up. Sean at na 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 na. You know, That's what they took. They took Sean from your full name. No, no, no. Sean is my second name. Okay, it is my okay, actual second okay. name. You know, um, so even at school, how I started using it at school, we had great, literally in the queue, grade two, and I remember the teacher looking down at our names, Lishlo, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> they just automatically went to your second name. Without no, even trying. All, you know? So it's, it's, it's so interesting, you know, and that's just how privilege, you know, plays itself out, you know. Um, but I, I want to maybe kick for touch, you know, and say, okay, cool. But let's maybe acknowledge some of the implications maybe before we kick for touch. Some of the implications of male privilege, some of the implications of other privileges in society. What has privilege done to our society? Why is it so important for us to look at privilege? Before we do that, I just want to go back one step. And that is to say that I know a lot of people that are watching this right now might be feeling like they can relate to your experiences and to your experiences. And they go, but I also experienced hardship. I also had to get up early in the morning to go to mm. school. I also, I mean, I have maybe one of the shortest names that I can think of and still have that problem with people yeah. pronouncing my name and asking me if they have. But it, that doesn't make it okay to say there's no privilege. Privilege doesn't make us immune to hardship, and I think that's something really important that we need to, to realize, is even though we each face our own hardships, we're not, we're not saying that you don't have hardships, but we're, not, we're also not saying that there isn't an aspect of privilege that we mustn't acknowledge. You know, I might have the same issue, but it might not be because of the same reason. Yeah, I actually want to highlight something that you've just said. Um, and it comes down to, first of all, Black Lives Matter, and it comes down to the Men Are Trash movement. Um, everything that you've said. Not all men are trash, and all lives do matter, okay? And that's what you're saying. And I think it's like, I don't know if you all remember what happened with Uya Nene last year. And the Men Are Trash movement and the Me Too movement gained traction, and people started saying, but men are raped too. Men are sexually assaulted too. Men experience this too. And I think the fact is that we're not saying that white people don't have hardships or haven't experienced hardships, okay? We're not saying that white people don't have to get up at 5 a.m., 6 a.m. in the morning to get to school. But the fact is that it's not the majority. The fact is that I can't name anyone off the top of my head that I know that had to catch three or four taxis to get to school, who had to then take those three or four taxis back home, who maybe was even had a was the head of their household and still in school, still doing things like that. So where I completely agree that things do happen, 
uh, white people do have hardships. White people do, and men do experience sexual assault. I am less inclined to give it attention because the fact is that the amount of violence against women is, you, it's actually not even comparable to the violence against, sexual violence against men. The racism, there's no such thing as reverse racism, so I'm not even going to get onto that. But the racism that black people experience can't even be compared to the hard, I, this is just my personal opinion. Um, so that just on what you were saying is that I, I agree with you. I think that there are circumstances where white people are have hardships and all of that. I think, Rebecca, and maybe an important point for us to maybe acknowledge is that the shared hardships is that the difference between the two is that one is systematic and one is not. Mm. So when one is systematic, it means that I did not choose yeah. to wake up at the time. The only way I could potentially make it in life, and I say that as a very loose statement, is if I wake up at the time. Yeah. There is a big difference between a male who gets in trouble while walking on the road because of a social ill, because of a shared social ill, and a woman who gets victimized by virtue, by default, of their gender. Mm. One is systematic, one is very much, it's something that we are taught, you know, growing up. There's a huge difference between me saying to my siblings, I've got one sister and two brothers, and I can imagine all of us at home at the same time, and now me cleaning and them just sitting around. There's a big difference between me saying, guys, you guys are just sitting around while I'm cleaning, and us, my three, my two brothers and I, just sitting around because we're expecting my sister to clean because she's the female. There's a huge difference between the two situations. And one needs to be addressed as a systematic issue. And the systematic response to that is saying, hey, guys, let's acknowledge that we are, our behavior is very trashy. Uh, <laughs> I love that. Um, and I think, um, well, oh, my goodness, I've just lost my train of thought. Uh, no, I haven't lost my train of thought. Jesus. <laughs> um, I think that to look at, the truth is, we have a very westernized understanding of Jesus. Blonde hair, blue eyes, light-skinned, English-speaking the only blonde haired guys in the middle. The only uh, blonde blonde haired guy, guy in the, in the Middle, middle East. East. <laughs> and I think that we need to be reminded that Jesus was a brown skinned, homeless hippie. He had he had he didn't have a place to lay his head at night. He was always found on the side of the marginalized. There isn't an instance where I mean there is where Jesus says, "Pay your ta pay what is owed to Caesar to Caesar." So we he is very political. Jesus is very political, and I think that sometimes we as Christians, it's always like church and state must be separated. But the truth is that Jesus was a political person. Maybe not what the Jews expected, but he was radical in his belief towards women. He was radical in his belief towards people that were marginalized, and he was radical to, towards people that were different, but he was also radical towards the tax collector. He was radical uh, when Zacchaeus is in the tree, and he says, come down from there. What are you doing up there? So he didn't favor the poor. He didn't favor the rich. He was fair and um, but he also stood up for people when, when it was needed. He, he, so we speak about the woman that was about to be stoned because she was caught in adultery. He didn't care about what the Pharisees and Sadducees and the men at the time had to say about it. He didn't care. The only thing he cared about was protecting a woman who had been treated wrong. Treated um, because she was a female. Um, and, and I actually just quickly um, want to read something in Matthew, the Beatitudes, to be honest. Um, but I want to read this one specific part, just quickly. I'm going to read verses 3 to 11. Okay, so chapter. it says, oh, chapter 5. Um, Be blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of their righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil things against you because of me. There's an expectation here that these things are going to happen to us. There's an expectation here that Jesus sets an expectation that because we follow him, people will wrongfully persecute us. People will say evil things about us because we stand by Jesus. And standing by Jesus is standing by black people. Standing by Jesus is standing by women. Standing by Jesus is even though people may not be, um, may not love the way that heterosexual people love, that people may not fall in line Jesus stood on the side of the marginalized. And there's actually an expectation in the Beatitudes that we, in our lifetime, we should be persecuted against because we took the side of the oppressed. Um, and that, so that's just something that I took from it. And I know that we're running out of time. I think we have about five minutes or so. So I just wanted to quickly say that. And I think there was an important point that you mentioned, you know, and maybe just kicking for touch in our conversation. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's been, there's been so much that we've actually all shared. Mm. You know, we've shared um, around scripture, you know, we've brought some critical stuff that you brought out of scripture, you know, um, Elsa shared some critical stuff also mm. just around reason, us grappling with this whole concept of privilege, you know, and we all know that our, we draw from a history where people have been excluded because of privilege and what yeah. privilege has done to this world, you know, and that we know that in instances where the world has been quiet about, where the church has been quiet about privilege and has not addressed it, even though Jesus addressed it, because when you look at the scripture with that woman, he addresses two things. Mm. You know, he addresses the issue of privilege and then he addresses the issue of, um, you know, what that woman had done, you know. He stands up for that woman and then says, go sin no more, you know. But while we acknowledge all of that, I think maybe just as we kick for touch, one thing that I thought maybe might be worth it, um, you know, is to say to someone who's sitting at home and saying, look, I get all of this. We've had these conversations about privilege. What on earth do I do with my privilege? Well, one, um, we do not promise all the answers, but please do join us in the journey. Um, but I think even two from my side is just to say, um, there is a sense in which um, I've began to view what we ought to do with privilege as an opportunity for us. There's, there's people who, could, who would say that, should I use my privilege to fight for those who are lesser privileged or what? But I think the first thing, the first and most important thing that I just want to challenge people to do this week as we go on a journey is acknowledge your privilege. Yeah. Privilege blinds. Be honest about your privilege. Let's just do that for this week. I don't know. That's my suggestion. Um, but I just want to say this week I want to work on acknowledging my privilege. And I think... Just in light of George Floyd, um, I don't know how many of you are aware, but last week, Wednesday, um, <clears throat> a black man was lynched or murdered um, by police in America, and it has caused an uproar, uproar all over the world. It's not an American issue. It's a world issue. There's deep systemic racism in South Africa, too. I just want to encourage people. I spoke to one of my friends last night and I just said to her, I said, how are you feeling in light of this? And she just said, Rebecca, I just can't educate people anymore. I can't f have my colleagues messaging me saying, how can I do better or what have I done wrong? I need a breath to experience the trauma. I need a breath just to breathe and just to be black and not to have to educate people on this. And I maybe for myself, <clears throat> I want to say that Use Google, like Google's your best friend. Read articles, um, download books, educate yourself on what your privilege looks like. If you are watching this and you and you know that you have benefited from white privilege, I'm going to link 27 books that you can read on white privilege. Um, if you are a man watching this and you feel like that you have had, um, you have a male privilege. There's a book called Feminist Jesus by Sarah Bessie. There's a book called Equal um, that I must just find. Anything by Rachel Held Evans. Um, 
I, that, that is the beginning. Besides just acknowledging your privilege, I think educating yourself on your privilege is also the la uh, a launching pad um, into not becoming less privileged because that will never happen, but understanding your privilege and how to leverage it and how to use your platform to become an ally, to either become a white ally or to become an ally to, to women or to become an ally disabled. to the gay community, an ally to the disabled community. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think just something that's, that's really important about you know, seeking that understanding is actually listening. Um, so often we get into a conversation like, guys, I want to understand, but I spend most of the time talking about what I either don't understand, what I think I understand. Mm. You know, and there's, I think it's something that Stephen Covey said. Um, he's <laughs> got this book about, you know, most successful habits and stuff. And he says, um, seek to understand before you are understood. Wow. You know, and I think that's so important is just listening to people's stories in this. Um, I was listening to a couple of video links that Loni sent to us from um, Chimimanga and Kosedichi. You know, and just listening to that, you kind of look at these topics, you're like, what, what on earth have I got to learn? You know, I've heard it all. But actually take the time to listen to, to videos, to, um, to watch videos, sorry, listen to podcasts, read the books, um, and listen to people's stories. Don't mm -hmm. approach... Um, don't approach your, your black friends or your female friends as a as educators necessarily because like you said they need to also be in that space mm. but when they do do speak about it listen yeah um, and and try and seek understanding there's so much i mean i like you said google is your friend i i was googling and and just it opens your eyes up to how much there is um, it's easy to sometimes say, but I don't understand and, and I don't have a lifetime of learnings to be able to understand and I haven't experienced it. And, but when you actually start researching and, and reading and, and listening, you realize, hey, you do have an understanding. What if it is right? What if it is maybe a bit skewed? And, and you start to become aware of, of your privilege. So just, just listen and seek to understand before you're understood. Great. Love it. And I think we shall then call it a wrap. Um, this is where we end for today. But maybe please do join us, not maybe, please do join us for our Bible study, which will also unpack these conversations even more um, that will be taking place on Tuesdays. Um, but I think from um, myself, you know, I really hope it will be an awesome journey. I hope we'll be open to learning. Um, it all begins by acknowledging where we are. Yeah. Thank you. Shall we pray? Yeah. Good. Okay. God, we thank you that you are merciful and good and kind and patient with us. God, please forgive us where we have fallen short, where we have not reflected you well. God, please be with us as we journey through this series of privilege, God, and please remove the scales from our eyes where we have them. Lord, teach us. Help us. We look to you, God, as for guidance. And we pray that you empty all of us and that you fill us with your words and your understanding, Lord, that we may not be blinded to our privilege, whatever that privilege may be. Help us reflect on it and not to get stuck in that place, but to propel ourselves forward, becoming part of the solution instead of aiding the problem. We pray this in your name. Amen.